Good afternoon. Welcome or welcome back to our final educational seminar after the Supreme Court oral arguments by telephone. This is our uh, educational seminar on Shafalo versus Washington and Colorado versus Baca, the so-called faithless elector cases. And once again, we are, have a collaboration between SCOTUS blog and Street Law. And so joining me to unpack the oral argument on Wednesday, we have Kathy Ruffy from Street Law, where she's a senior director. She also taught, before going to Street Law, she taught AP government in Fairfax County, Virginia for 27 years. Thanks for joining us, Kathy. Thank you. Thanks, Amy. Um, before we get into the cases today and what happened to oral arguments, we'd like to know who our audience is. So in a moment, a poll is going to pop up. And if you wouldn't mind taking the poll, we'd love to see who is here today. So it's going to ask you if you are a middle school student in civics, some kind of other middle school student, a variation of high school students, um, teachers or others. Um, a law student is in there also. So please just take a moment to, to let us know who you are. And um, then hopefully we'll be able to tailor our presentation a little bit to who we know is out there. Of course, this seminar um, was advertised for middle school students. So our prepared uh, materials are, are based at the middle school level, um, but we'll see who is with us. Should we give it another second, Cal, or are we? Good to see the results. So while we're waiting, one thing I forgot to mention is that we are going to talk for about 20 minutes about the oral argument on Wednesday, and then we're going to try to leave some time for your questions. So if you have questions, you can leave them for us on the Q&A feature, or you can email them to us at feedback at scotusblog.com. It's excellent. Okay, good. Good to know who's out there. Okay, so I'm gonna start out by just telling you a little bit about the case, the background of one of the cases in case you missed the preview and the oral argument. So this case is um, Chafalo, or as the chief pronounced it, Chiafalo, um, the, the state of Washington. And it's really about these three electors, and you can say them in this order, Levi Guerrera, who is a student who is, uh, who is um, 20 years old now, I think she was 19 at the time that she cast her uh, a vote in the Electoral College. So she's not much older than many of the students that here today. And then um, Brett Shafalo is the circled um, there as well. He, um, He's the person the name the case is named after because it goes in alphabetical order, and then Esther John, um, who you see on the right. So these three people are important because they were nominated to serve as electors for the Democratic Party in the 2016 election. And so those electors are chosen in the summer before the general election. And in Washington State, where they're from, they take um, they take a pledge that says they will vote for the eventual winner. Um, in the election if it's from their party. So Hillary Clinton did win the vote there with 54.4% of the vote. And so these um, electors then um, had pledged their vote for them, went to Olympia, the capital of Washington, um, on the designated day in December to, to um, vote for their elect in their capacity as electors. And these three electors, even though they knew that they might suffer a fine, um, elected to vote for Colin Powell instead of Hillary Clinton and three different individuals for, um, for vice president. And then as they knew what happened, the state fined them $1,000 each for, each for not voting for Hillary Clinton. Their votes were still sent to Washington. They were still counted, um, but they were fined for their activities. Second case, Colorado versus Baca, is similar but not identical to the Washington State case. There were three people nominated to serve as presidential electors for the Democratic Party in Colorado in 2016. Just like in Washington State, Hillary Clinton won the popular vote there. And one of them, Michael Baca, tried to cross out Hillary Clinton's name and vote for John Kasich, the former Republican governor of Ohio, 
but he was removed as an elector before he could do that, replaced with someone else. The other two, Polly Baca and Robert Nemenich, wanted to vote for someone else, but wound up voting for Clinton. So this is the uh, blown up version of the Colorado ballot. And we wanted to show you that on the Colorado ballot um, at issue in this case, Colorado v. Baca, um, it says right on the ballot that when you vote on election day as a citizen, you're not really voting for Clinton and Kane or Trump and Pence, you're really voting for the presidential electors who will represent those candidates. And so only, I think, six states actually do that. Most states um, don't have that appear on their ballot, but Colorado does. So um, that might make some kind of a difference um, in the fact that you're, you're informed that you're voting for the electors and not for the actual candidates. And I don't believe any states actually have the names of the electors on the ballot. So... Um, one of the things that we had in our preview, because we thought it might be um, it might be substantial in this case, and it turned out to be something that came up a lot in oral arguments, although they use different terms, is the ideas that um, about electors and their roles that Alexander Hamilton and James Madison wrote about uh, at the time of the ratification of the Constitution. So in the oral arguments, the justices talked a lot about the ideas of electors as free agents or the electors as proxies. So Alexander Hamilton um, in the Federalist Papers wrote that electors should be independent and should have the final stay. And a quote from him was that he said they would be most capable of analyzing the qualities required to be a good president. So that was Hamilton's view. He thought they would be free agents. So obviously in this case, the electors would like us to look to Hamilton to tell us what the, what the framers meant when they wrote the Constitution, specifically when they wrote about the Electoral College and when, um, amendment, um, and when the 12th Amendment was ratified, not there very long thereafter. James Madison thought that electors should be proxies for the popular vote. So he said that they should reflect the votes of the people and that the president should have, um, the, the president should be the choice of the people at large. So the states would like you to look to Madison. And in, in fact, during the oral arguments, um, the advocates for the electors did cite Hamilton several times and the advocates for, Matt, for um, the state cited Madison a few times. Um, so those terms came up a lot and we'll be using those terms too, free agents versus proxies. Okay, so what are oral arguments? So this is a, a sketch because cameras are not allowed in the courtroom. This is a sketch um, from before the COVID-19 pandemic that shut down the court. This is what they usually look like. Um, oral arguments are a chance for the advocates to summarize their arguments, to answer the questions that are important to the justices. So a lot of times it kind of tips the hands of the justices because we see what issues they're really interested in. Um, it's not really time for the justices to get new information. The justices have done their homework. They have read the, um, the decisions of lower courts. They've read the briefs from the two parties. They read a bunch of what are called um, amicus or amicus briefs. So they've read briefs from lots of different organizations weighing in on this, on this issue. They know their stuff by the time they get there. So when they ask questions, you can think of it more as an actual conversation between the justices on the bench. They don't have to convince the advocate. They don't have to convince the people seated there. They have to convince each other because only those nine votes count. So the bench used to be completely straight. And at some point in the history of the court, they actually cut the bench and moved it so that the justices on the end could hear each other talk because they realized it's really a conversation between the justices. Um, when the justices ask questions, sometimes they're poking holes in the arguments, trying to show where there's a weakness in the argument, or sometimes they lob what we call softballs. So they're, they're setting, sometimes they help a, an advocate make their argument 
by asking them a question and say, isn't that true or don't you see it that way? And really all the, all the advocate has to do is say, yeah, I think, I think you're right. So that's what oral arguments are. Both sides get, get a half an hour. Um, usually in the court, they are peppered with questions in any kind of a random order. So the justices just sort of insert their voices. Things are different now in the, in the era of COVID-19. Um, the court shut down and now um, this, these cases were the last cases to be argued live um, over the telephone. Um, and so they kept um, a new rule that the Supreme Court instituted internally this year where the attorneys had two minutes to talk with no questions asked. So they have two minutes to sort of put their best foot forward, uh, really give a summary of their case and then now on the phone arguments, the chief justice calls on the other justices in order of seniority. And then both sides have a half an hour as usual. The argument for the electors. The electors said, look, this question before the court is straightforward. The constitution doesn't say anything about giving the states the power to control how an elector can vote. They weren't using this in the despicable me context, but they said the states are asking the justices to interpret the word elector as agent or even minion in the sense that the people go to the polls, they vote for a candidate for president, and all that the electors are doing is rubber stamping the popular vote choice for president. The justices were concerned that there was an argument that if you look at the Constitution and what it requires, perhaps it would be chaos. And the electors' response was, perhaps if the framers thought there would be a difference between what the people wanted and what the electors wanted, maybe they would have done something different. But the justices don't get to decide what plan is better, the electors were arguing. The question is what the Constitution requires. And the Constitution indicates that the framers wanted the electors to have the discretion to choose the candidate that they thought would do the best job, even if it wasn't the candidate that they originally pledged to support. If you want there to be a different plan, then we need to change the Constitution. But right now, this is what the Constitution says. The states appoint electors and the electors have discretion, and the states don't have any control after they are appointed. Justice Alito asked, suppose an elector is bribed between the time of the popular vote and the time when the electors vote. Can the states remove that elector? And the answer from the advocates um, for, the, um, for the electors was basically no, not unless there's a conviction. If there's a conviction, they can be um, removed, but not up until that point, which prompted the justices to ask a lot more questions about, are there any limits on when a, an elector might be restricted? So um, Amy alluded in her introduction about chaos. So um, there were several questions about chaos and Justice Alito and Justice Kavanaugh seem to be most concerned about chaos. As a matter of fact, Justice um, Kavanaugh talked about the quote, avoid chaos principle of judging, um, where he said, if it's a really close case, um, that, they, that the justices should choose the side that would avoid chaos. So you can see in this question, um, they're asking, they're, they're raising that concern with the advocates for the electors and saying that it might lead to chaos. Um, and that do you deny that it is a good possibility if your argument prevails? And the answer from the advocates here was it's not a good possibility. It's a possibility. They couldn't deny that it wasn't a possibility, but they said it's not a good possibility because if you remember at the beginning when I talked about um, how the how electors are chosen, um, the electors are chosen because they are long-standing loyal members of the party. So the Democratic Party picks people for ceremonial reasons to give them um, you know, to, to honor them. And they're going to pick people who donate a lot of money, spend a lot of time campaigning. They're not going to pick people who, um, who might just jump ship. So in the case of the electors for these cases, um, if Hillary Clinton would have won as Democratic electors, they would have voted. Uh, if, they if Hillary Clinton would have won in the Electoral College, they would have happily voted for Hillary Clinton. They voted um, for someone else in the hopes that they might disrupt the Electoral College and send the election to the House of Representatives and thereby deny um, President Trump 
the 270 electoral votes he needs. So their answer was, it is a possibility, it's not a good possibility. Um, Brett Kavanaugh asked, um, wouldn't your position potentially disenfranchise voters in the states with faithless electors? Um, and so his concern was, if the, the people, if the state appoints the electors and the people choose Hillary Clinton, and then you go and vote for somebody else, aren't you effectively undoing their vote, taking away their vote? And they, I can't remember, Kathy, what exactly did, did they say? I mean, I think they said essentially that, that, again, that is a possibility, but it hasn't actually happened. Yes, they said that the discretion lies with the electors and it is it is possible, but that the but that it's not probable because the electors are probably gonna be chosen based on their loyalty and not um, not go to the positions of their state. Do you want me to take this one? Okay, um, and then. Um, Clarence Thomas asked a question that got some, um, that's gotten a lot of press about, um, about Frodo Baggins. So I think he was just trying to point out sort of what Amy was just alluding to, that um, the electors might go and just vote for whoever they want to vote for. So, so he conjured up Frodo Baggins for some reason. I'm not sure. Maybe Clarence Thomas is a big Lord of the Rings fan. But he said if an elector is... Um, if the elector who has promised to vote for the winning candidate can suddenly, you know, I'm going to vote for Frodo Baggins, I really like him, are you saying under your system you can't do anything about that? And again, the answer was pretty much, yeah, we can't do anything about that, um, that they have discretion, that that's part of um, what it means to be an elector, and that, um, and, but that the, but the possibility of that not of happening is not very likely. Um, he did bring up a point that leads to the last sort of funny question, and that was about the fact that you do have to vote for a real person, and he sort of pointed out that Frodo Baggins is not a real person. Do you want to take this one, Amy? Yes, and so the Chief Justice said, well, you know, again, one of the things that the, the justices are often trying to do at oral argument is figure out what are the limits? Um, you know, in this case, there's there's more or less just two choices. Do the electors have discretion? Do the electors not have discretion? But frequently, there's often sort of gray areas in between, and the justices are trying to figure out where they're going to draw the line. But here, so this was a question for Jason Harrow, who represented the Colorado electors. What are the limits of your position? And he said, yeah, you have to vote for a person. And because the chief justice said, well, could they vote for a giraffe? And, and Jason Harrow said, no, of course, they can't vote for a giraffe. They have to vote for a person. Okay. And that's just the, the summation of the arguments um, for the elector. So we covered all of those. Um, maybe we didn't cover so much, um, what if the candidate dies? So that was one of the things that they said, if you go with the states with this very strict, they're bound for who they said the pledge for, what if that person dies? And those of us who are West Wing fans know that um, that, that happened um, in on the West Wing with the vice presidential candidate. So everything you need to know about government, you can learn from the West Wing. <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to quickly go through the arguments for the states and then we're going to open it up for questions. Um, so the state's arguments are pretty straightforward. It's not going to take me very long. They basically say that the Constitution doesn't impose any limits on the state's power to place conditions on electors. So they even said that they might be able to say if the person doesn't come to the state and and um, and do their uh, and, and you know and um, come to the state and ask the voters to vote for them. Maybe they wouldn't allow their electors. So the state, they were saying they have plenary power, which means sort of like almost complete power to, to restrict their electors. And they said that even though it doesn't say anywhere in the constitution that they have the power to remove electors, it says that they have the power to appoint them and to regulate them. And so that includes the power to remove. Um, and they should be able to do that in the case um, where someone has been bribed. So the, the 
concept of an elector being bribed came up a lot in the state's arguments um, or pulls a bait and switch. Um, but they were most concerned about bribery and being able to buy an elector's vote. Um, so some of the questions are very telling um, about where some of the justices might have, have um, problems with their arguments. So Ruth Bader Ginsburg said, what are the practical consequences of ruling against the states? Most states already require elector pledges. Over the course of US history, faithless voting has been rare. So um, a lot of states do require pledges. Um, there was a Supreme Court case that was used as a precedent often in this case that says that states can have pledges, they just can't enforce those pledges. Um, and there have, think, have been 108 votes over the course of the, the um, our history that are have been faithless. So what difference does it actually make? And um, the attorney for um, Mr. Baca said that chaos could result from the upholding upholding of the lower court circuit and that it could occasion a constitutional crisis. So his answer to what difference could it make is we could have a constitutional crisis. Elena Kagan asked, Oops, what is your best textual argument? Because, um, you know, I'm sure you've heard about originalism and people who look to the, to the text of the Constitution. That's usually the conservatives, but that seems to work against them in this case because the text seems to imply that electors have choices. And when we look to most of the framers, it says the same thing. So she's asking him basically to say, put your finger on the place in the constitution that says that states can restrict their electors. And his answer um, basically was that it doesn't say states can't. And because it doesn't say states can't, that implies that they, that they can't. He says, just that nothing in the Constitution limits state authority over how to appoint electors or whether states can impose conditions to enforce them. And she kind of pushes him on it and he just says um, the power to appoint includes the power to remove and that's in the text. Um, so that seems to like it might be important to Justice Kagan. And the last one I thought it was great because um, I mentioned at the beginning at the onset that they ask these questions in order of seniority. And of course, Justice Kavanaugh is the least senior. So just as the, art, the um, advocate for Colorado is wrapping up, Justice Kavanaugh kind of gets at the heart of it and says, then why do we even have electors? What is the purpose of having electors? So I'm gonna let you listen to that question and answer. Hopefully the technology Thank you, Chief Justice. Good morning, General. What is the purpose of having electors? Thank you for that question, Justice Kavanaugh. When electors are set up in the constitutional design, that allows for states to make a choice. Electors can either vote as proxy voters on behalf of the public, as we do here in Colorado, or they can be free agents. By having this structure uniform across the several states, you give states the ability to choose which model they want. So they go on, but we're kind of short on time. But so that's his answer. So why do we even have electors? So again, that's sort of the summation of um, the points for the states. Um, and it, again, it came down largely to are they free agents or, or proxies? Um, so we're going to turn to Q&A. And um, you can put your questions in the chat or you can put your questions in the Q&A. Okay. Um, do you want to do the poll? Oh, sure, sure. We can do that first, yeah. Okay, so now that you've heard uh, both of what happened at oral arguments, both on the side of the, uh, of the electors and on the side of the states. Um, we'd like to know two things in this poll, not only who should the Supreme Court decide for, so that would sort of be your opinion if you, could, if you were a justice, but also um, how will the Supreme Court decide? And uh, I mentioned before that the, the oral arguments is a conversation between the justices. So court, um, court watchers like to 
look at all the questions and sort of try to decide who they think each person's going to go for and count up the votes. And sometimes they're right and sometimes they're not right. Um, Amy, sometimes we're definitely wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Amy can give you in the summary maybe um, what people out there are saying about this, what people are writing about who they think the court will decide for. Yeah, I think that, the, well, we'll let people vote and then we'll and that what we do have, we have a question. Soon for purposes of discussion, the court endorses a free agent theory of elector authority. In that case, how does it change how the candidates run for president in 2020? That's a great question. You know, I think it, it, uh, you know, I wonder whether it changes how people run in the sense that after that the election wouldn't necessarily be over after November 4th or whenever the when, whenever election night is because that would be sort of the, the first round of balloting but then if the elect, electors could change their votes particularly if the vote was close you know the, the sort of the election could continue to try to sway the electors to change their votes when it came time for, for the Electoral College to cast their votes. Particularly given the way news is developing these days with the with COVID-19 and everything like that. Kathy, do you have thoughts? I was just gonna say, I think it might more than anything change the way the parties choose their electors. Yes, it's, I think that's a great point. Since the parties have sort of, in many states have sort of assumed that these electors are just minions, um, <laughs> as the oral argument started out with that term, um, I don't, they were very ceremonial. And I think that, um, you know, given, given to people to honor them and, you know, all those kinds of things. But now they, they might really look at those electors closely to make sure that they, that they wouldn't stray if their candidate won. Yeah, I think, I want, of course, I wonder if the, uh, you know, if the fines if you might change. Well, I get, no, I guess there wouldn't be fines if the, the free agents. Because that, that would be part of getting rid of the fines. All right, ready to share the results. All right, let's see. What do people think? Who do you think that the court should that people should decide for the electors? Do you think everyone thinks that the Supreme Court will decide for the states? Fascinating. Yeah, I mean, I think I think that that is pretty much sort of the conventional wisdom. I think that there was a sense coming away from the argument that you know if you look at the text of the Constitution. It does seem to suggest that the states don't have a lot of control over the electors once they are appointed, but that it is, you know, it, it, that if it is to the extent that it is a close call, that as one of the justices, I think it was actually Justice Kavanaugh, um, mentioned in his questions for one of the, I think it was probably Professor Lessig who argued on behalf of the Washington electors. You know, if it's a close call, why wouldn't the court err on the side of avoiding the potential chaos um, that might ensue if they rule that the electors are free agents? You know, I think the court is very concerned about chaos. Yeah, so there's an interesting question. Um, would a ruling for electors mean states would have to put electors' names on the ballot? That's an interesting question. I don't know that it would, um, you know, most decisions about ballots and elections in general are left to the states. So I don't, I doubt that it would dictate that they, that they would, but perhaps to hold them accountable, um, it might be a method used to try to, um, persuade people not to be an elector unless you're really willing to vote for the candidate who wins. That is an interesting question. And then we had one more question, which is which way would an originalist justice come out? And just as a reminder, an originalist justice is someone who believes you should interpret the Constitution looking at the text and how the people who wrote it would believe it was meant to be interpreted rather than interpret sort of how they how the Constitution would evolve over time. And, and I think it's a fascinating question. I mean, if you, as I mentioned, if you look at the text, it's not really that clear that the states have a lot of power after they're appointed. You know, I think 
Justice Thomas and Justice Gorsuch are probably the strongest originalists on the court. So I think we'll have a much better sense of what an originalist justice might, might think in a couple of months. All right. Thanks to all of you for attending today and um, stay well, have a good weekend. Take care. Thank you. Thanks, Kathy.